Hey, it's Mazzy, and this is a video on the end of ABC Records. The end of my career in ABC, as well as the uh, end of the label ABC Records in 1979. I worked for them from 1978 into 1979 when they were acquired by MCA Records. Lost my job, was rehired, worked for uh, MCA for another year. And I thought about this because of this announcement of Steely Dan and uh, these analog production Steely Dan uh, issues coming out. Now, just a little note, this is not about that judgment, otherwise good, bad, and the ugly. There are some amazing 45 RPMs. I assume they're going to be wonderful through analog productions that are box sets in those wonderful boxes that people, uh, when they like to have their library look like an old legal law, law library wall full of box sets. Uh, and they're going to be all analog 45 RPM records on super duper ooper vinyl. But also take note that Universal, Geffen Universal, is putting out a series of those records that are from a digital cut that Bernie Grunman prepared Someone else is cutting it lacquer to vinyl, and those are going to be out for $29. So I assume maybe on various sites in the U.S., this is from a U.S. perspective, can get them for uh, $25, $26. So there is going to be a reasonable version. So if you want to get go full-blown and get the full audio file treatment, you have that. But you can get these records. If you take your time, you can get original records. Now... Let me start with Steely Dan and my career with ABC Records. I worked in the record business. I've said that ad nauseum, but there's always some new people that don't know that. From 1973 through 81, I believe, uh, 80, 81. And um, in 1977, I graduated college. I left uh, the record store I was managing and going to college at the same time. I went to Europe in early 1978, my first trip to England. And when, when I got back, I started working for ABC Records, the label ABC in San Francisco. We had this really cool office. It was in an Edwardian flat in San Francisco on the corner of Bush Street and Laguna. If you know the city, it's just up a few blocks from Japantown and a few blocks down from Pacific Heights. And it was a really cool office. I moved in uh, up on Mount Tamalpais in Mill Valley with my girlfriend Nancy at the time who was a weekend disc jockey on Saturday and Sunday nights. She had the 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift at KSAN Radio. And I got the job, and I commuted in every morning from Mount Tam. We didn't have to be in, I think, till 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock, record business hours in those days. So it was an easy drive in those days coming down the mountain, going across the Golden Gate Bridge, and that beautiful drive every morning to Bush Street and to ABC Records. And I was hired originally... Uh, to do merchandising, to go in stores like Tower Records, Warehouse Records, Record Factory, bring in uh, promotional equipment, put displays up uh, for the various artists on ABC Records. I would also uh, do inventories of uh, so the salespeople could fill in the gaps at Tower Records and the other stores. And so it was probably the low, orig initially the lower tier, but I just loved it. It was working for ABC Records. A label that wasn't as cool as some records, but we had a handful of artists. Now, historically, you can go back. You had Ray Charles and ABC Records. You had the great Impulse Catalog, which I'll um, mention a little bit when we get into this. Great, All those great Impulse Jazz records, ABC. So I really got into jazz even more so during this time. Um, early on, before my time, too, Steppenwolf was on ABC. I mean, you had... Um, just a, an amazing array of artists, a lot of blues artists like Blobby Blue Bland. There were different sub labels of ABC. So every Monday morning, another part of my job was calling up retail record stores, the stores that reported to the trades, that reported to Billboard, to Cashbox, uh, the several other soul charts to try to get our singles up. This is before SoundScan. SoundScan uh, was a thing that started, I believe, in the 90s, where all of a sudden things shifted. And sales were reported based on retail sales electronically from from actual sales. But in those days, you'd call them up, you'd grease the wheels. So my job was saying, okay, we need to push this record and that record. So the record at the time that I was working on 
as our whole office was, that came out in late 1977 was Steely Dan's Asia. Uh, arguably uh, their best album. That's subjective, obviously. It's their more jazzy, more, more, you know, this is one of those sonic masterpieces that audiophiles just cream in their jeans over. And it is a wonderful uh, record. And the singles, it, they didn't do as well as some of their other songs, but it made for a better selling album. What a what a great, great album produced by Gary Katz. Um, and Steve Diener was the, our president, my boss at ABC Records in LA, even though I worked out of the San Francisco office. But they had two singles uh, prior to my arrival at ABC. And the record that I promoted initially was the song Josie. And... We really pushed that, and this is a 12-inch single of Josie. I wish, I realized, I don't know why they didn't do this as a 45 RPM. Everyone's into 45 RPM 12-inch singles. Uh, this is around the time, remember, that disco was happening, and 12-inch single DJ editions were uh, popular around 76, 77, 78. And this is from 1978. And it has the same stereo uh, version on both sides. Usually you'd have a stereo and mono mix, but this is uh, my copy from ABC Records of Josie. And I do feel fortunate. When I worked at ABC, I was able to get so many free promos every month to keep for myself. I would get boxes of promos. I literally probably had four to five promo boxes of this and the subsequent Greatest Hits album that I would give away. And I remember when I left ABC, I probably had a box or two of each, and I should have kept them. But luckily, I kept my original Steely Dan records. This was a time where we didn't talk about pressings, we didn't talk about dead wax of different labels, and sometimes you would just get the latest label because it was the cleanest copy you had. And I think in 95, I got rid of all my duplicates at the time of my Steely Dan records. So I did kept this, keep this one. I did realize I got rid of my promo stamp copy. But this is the appropriate dead wax, which I'm not going to get into in this video. So it'll be interesting for some to see if this UHQR exceeds it, what the digital $29 versions will be like. And... The one I got before was this record. Now, this is an early promo cut that was still in our promo uh, closet. We could pull like stuff for ourselves and for, uh, you know, record salespeople and, and radio uh, promo people, and we'd give them copies. So this is my copy of that. And then luckily, I kept all the original labels and copy. Just go back really quickly because I wasn't promoting them as much as fulfilling them in the stores uh, to keep the entire catalog. And Katie lied. Amongst my favorite is Pretzel Logic. Countdown to Ecstasy. And this is my very original copy of uh, Steely Dan's Can't Buy a Thrill. I love this record. This was very unique when it came out. Not as jazzy, but just a really wonderful mix and just really, again, well recorded. Um, but I promoted all this stuff. Even though you were reporting the latest single and the biggest hits, I was pushing the catalog of ABC Records. This is the last Steely Dan album I promoted. This is a double album, the best of. Uh, had one new song to get you to buy it. That's what we all did in the record business. But this is a fantastic comp, and I suggest you seek this out. Uh, this, again, is my promo copy from ABC Records. Had one extra track here at the Welcome, uh, here at the Western World. And what's really also great about this sonically, it was cut by Robert Ludwig, and it sounds fantastic. One of the best comps uh, that I know of, a two-record set, has all uh, their hits, a couple of deep cuts, because uh, they were really a band uh, that didn't have a lot of huge top singles but they were an album band and they have a lot of deep cuts that fm radio just played all the time whatever you think about steely dan if you just want to dip your toes this is the place to go not the subsequent single mca record this is the one this is this is sonically really beautiful and i highly recommend this and i had a fun time promoting this and it's nice when you work for a label where people actually want your promo copies not promo copies that are some artists and some shit ass record that you're trying to like literally get in the stores get them to buy it get them to play it in the stores or on the radio uh, everybody wanted a copy of this record in 1978
Uh, one of our biggest artists when I worked there, not only was Steely Dan, was Jimmy Buffett. He was huge at that time. And, and for whatever reason, I got rid of my Jimmy Buffett records in the mid 90s. You know, I get in moods, but I realize, and I've said this on my channel before, don't get rid of your records because of your mood, especially if you're younger. You go through cycles. You, I went through my punk cycle, so I felt that Jimmy Buffett and post-punk and new wave and indie stuff wasn't kind of cool and stuff. But I kept my Jackson Brown records because I love that kind of stuff. And I've come around and sometimes I'm in the mood for those type of records. So unless you really have to, don't sell your records on a whim thinking you're not going to listen to them, especially as you're younger. When you get older, you you're... Your tastes evolve, you come back, there's nostalgia factor, there's moods you're in. So the other record and the other artist that we were really pushing that hadn't broken yet, he was big on FM stations, but he wasn't a huge, huge artist like he would become. And that's Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And when I first got uh, to ABC Records, I got this record. This originally it came out in 1976, so a year and a half prior to my arrival at ABC. But um, I, this is my original uh, promo copy from the promo closet. What a great record. I remember hearing American Girl, and of course, being the big Birds fan, I thought, this sounds like Roger McGuinn exactly. That had such a wonderful sound. And from Gainesville, Florida, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. I love this record. The, the record I promoted, again, one of my Monday morning uh, sales promotion things to try to get on the charts was a song from this album called Listen to Her Heart. That was a single that we were promoting. Uh, this is my original promo copy from ABC Records. This is Tom Petty's second record that came out in uh, 1978. And this, we really pushed, our, pushed this record. At the end of this video, you're gonna see a still frame of me holding uh, the first Tom Petty record in a tower record store uh i was doing an inventory and i was in, i think i'm in the p section actually uh holding this record and of course i got a little promo sheet in there oh that came with the came with the record there but um we really pushed this record and it it did really well but obviously it wasn't the big hit uh that would happen once abc was sold to mca and um this record came out now luckily uh in March, I guess, I think it was March or April of 1979, they called up the office and we all got laid off from ABC Records. The sale had gone through, it was official. That was, I think, around the time when we were all sent out, to, put out the pasture. And that was, I was crushed. I only had worked there about a year, less than a year. And I just loved that job. And I love the people I worked with. They were. They had a new staff of promo people that had came, that had come over f from Warner Brothers Records and other labels, RCA Records. So, ABC was was getting some new, great, great, interesting artists. And um, but after that, about two weeks later, I got a call and MCA hired me back for about a year. And I worked out of my house. I didn't work out of the MCA office. And of course. I did work this record, and this is the record that really put him over the top. This is the record that was somewhat controversial with Tom Petty because MCA wanted to raise the list price and make it a dollar more list price, and he fought the label. He even fought that, wait a second, I signed to, signed to ABC, not MCA, and luckily there was an agreement made, and this literally put him over the top. Refugee, here comes my girl. Don't do me like that. This had what, three hit singles, maybe four, and really made uh, Tom Petty a, a major, major artist. This is produced by um, Tom Petty and Jimmy Iovine, engineered by Sh the great engineer Shelly Yakis. So what a great sounding record. So I feel I had a, like a small part in this, working this record in the Bay Area, make sure, making sure the displays were up and, you know, the record was in the stores and calling up the... Um, the retailers to make sure this pushed, but it sold. It wasn't a phony uh, sale. It sold uh, really well. Another artist I pushed and I really got into, and I and I ended up acquiring in her, their and her entire catalog was Rufus. And this is the record that came out just prior to me arriving at ABC that I pushed this for about a year. In those days, you know, it's kind of like the movie business now. If something doesn't hit box office in the first weekend or two, it just kind of fades away, but you'd push a record a year or more in some cases, sometimes 
a year and a half. Uh, but this was a major hit, Rufus featuring Chaka Khan. Going back to Tom Petty, uh, we did a, we had a meeting in L.A., so I met Tom Petty in the band. Uh, we, there was a showcase there. Of course, um, I remember getting on the plane out of Burbank on my way home, and Tom Petty and the, and the Heartbreakers were at the airport, so I was able to uh, chat with him again because I had met him uh, the day before at the um, ABC offices in Los Angeles. And I did see him. We had a... a our entire office went to see him at the Winterland show he did in 1978 as well. So it was a great time to get freebie tickets to go to these shows, meet some of the artists. And again, uh, Chaka Khan, I mean, her voice is still great today and she's just wonderful. And these are really wonderfully uh, recorded records. ABC, I got the entire Rufus uh, catalog on ABC. Just love this record. Another record that um, was a band that I had been into from their days at uh, Epic Records. And they're one of those country rock bands that never quite made it. They're always like bubbling under. And it was so sad, too, to see them not selling in the course the Eagles explosion and the cult status of the Flying Breeder Brothers and Graham Parsons. And that's Poco. I was a fan of Poco from their first albums on Epic. Uh, Poco band originally named Pogo and they had to change the name because of the cartoon strip called Pogo and um, they really went through a, some a lot of incarnations obviously a couple members or had played with the Eagles after the fact and ABC had a couple records that uh, Rosa Cimarron and one called Crazy Eyes that did okay you know catalog sales cult sales but not a big hit until this record came out and this record was going to be the um, Paul Cotton, Rusty Young Band. It was recorded at that. It wasn't going to be a Poco album, but then ABC Records pushed them to release it as a Poco album. A little, uh, again, my ABC promo copy. I wish I had the poster. There was a lithograph that we all got in the office, a beautiful lithograph, I don't know, two feet by three feet of this, signed by the artist, the artist who did this was uh, Phil Hartman, the actor, the comedian who would later turn up uh, on Saturday Night Live because Phil Hartman's uh, brother managed uh, Poco and other bands. But he was an uh, album cover designer, a graphic designer, and this great, wonderful uh, cover. This became a hit. This became really big, a very in the M.O.R., Easy Road uh, with the song Crazy Love. So I worked this record as well, and um, it became a hit for Poco. Surprisingly, the M.O.R., and, you know, not a huge, massive thing, but this is the one that all of a sudden people noticed the band who hadn't heard the band before. But this is a beautiful record. Again, really well recorded. Poco on ABC Records, and this is Legend. Another... Uh, album that was early. I think he did two albums for ABC. After The Last Waltz, Le Levon Helm signed as a solo artist to ABC Records, and um, he did, I think, just two records, and this is the one I still have. I unfortunately don't have the other one. I used to have a picture disc of this. It was a promo-only picture disc, and I think I gave it to someone who just seemed to want it more than I, uh, than I uh, did. At our office one night, we were supposed to have a, a, a big party for some radio people at our office, the flat, the Edwardian flat in San Francisco, and Levon and his band were going to show up and be there, and they got stuck in a snowstorm and didn't make it to the party, and uh, unfortunately, I never met uh, Levon Helm, so that was unfortunate, but um, this is okay record. It's not a great record, but of course... You know, one of the great voices of the band and one of the great drummers and what a soulful, funky, gospel-y st style, uh, style voice. This is produced by uh, Donald Duck Dunn and it's got a great version of Take Me to the River. So it's, a, you know, you can find this pretty cheap in the stores, but I recommend this, Levon Helm on ABC Records. And I want to show this record because this is like, I remember when we got this sort of best of, it's... um. The best of David Crosby and Graham Nash. They had a separate career, solo career, the two of them as a, a duo signed to ABC. Of course, their stuff on Warner, or basically Atlantic Records for Crosby, Stills, Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young also. Uh, 
some of the artists had separate things. Obviously, Neil Young had a separate reprise uh, catalog put out there. But I remember when this album came out, this came out when I was working there, and I thought this was the worst cover of a comp ever. What a horrible cover. Now, this is a copy. Okay, this is a later copy that was uh, rebranded uh, through MCA. So I uh, apparently got this copy when MCA took uh, our catalog over. And what they would do, they'd literally, you'd see a lot of stamps like that. They took the exact pressings, the ABC pressings, everything else had ABC logos and monikers on it. So if you see this, pick it up because it's musically, it's really lovely. It, it's aside from the shit ass cover, it's got great music from uh, Wind on the Water, the uh, duo record they did, one of the duo records they did for ABC. It's also got uh, a tr couple tracks from Songs for Beginners, the Graham Nash album on Atlantic Records. So uh, crap ass, shit ass, funky cover, but good music. Uh, and, and I remember pushing the stuff. Before I close out with some uh, John Cole train for you, I want to show you the most embarrassing uh, record I ever had to try to promote in my career, my short-lived career working for ABC Records. And this is Arlen Gale. Look at that photograph. Just take a moment and look, look at this. The record is called Back to the Midwest Night. Look at that stare. Do you know what this is? Do you know what I'm talking about? Arlen Gale, Back to the Midwest Night. Take the Night Flight. Sunrise on Sunset, Suspicious Fires. Okay, this is produced by Mike Appel and managed by Mike Appel. Mike Appel was the original producer, manager of Bruce Springsteen. And 1978 is a time, obviously, Bruce Springsteen had been huge since Born to Run in 1975. And he found Arlen Gale. And I kind of feel sorry for Arlen Gale. This is not a bad record. And we had to push this record. And every time, I gave a, a shitload of these to everyone I knew, including my friends, promo copies of this record. Because it was really kind of a knockoff of trying to recapture that Bruce Springsteen intensity, the aura of Bruce, you know, the, the working class guy, you know, in the bridge. And I mean, this is Mike Appel. He lost Bruce Springsteen to John Landau. And of course... Uh, this was his answer to, to put Arlen Gale record out. And ABC, I guess, took the bait. I don't know that detail part of it. But um, I just remember this became a mocking uh, record for a lot of people. Radio, a couple people tried to play it. I think my, my girlfriend, Nancy, I got her to play it, even though it wasn't on their playlist. And um, there you go. Again, not a bad album, but... The obvious ripoff of a Bruce Springsteen style is just, it's just too much. So Arlen Gale, back to the midway, back to the Midwest night. I knew my career at ABC wasn't going to last long. And lately, I just want to say, I started out talking about how great the Impulse label was. And I literally went through and it was a time when uh, Impulse had the green label in the mid and late 70s, and I got a lot of those records. Unfortunately, I traded a lot of them in in my 95 Purge because, I don't know why, because of CDs. But I was able to get, I think I had 100 uh, Impulse records, new mid to late 70s pressings, you know, Coltrane and Art Blakey, and I mean all the Johnny Hartman, all the great stuff on Impulse. And I learned so much about jazz. Uh, but these are records I did keep between my time at ABC and MCA, because these are some interesting comps curated by Mark Michael Cuscuna, who would later go on to work at Blue Note. And there are a lot of uh, outtakes, alternate versions, and comps from uh, different tapes and things, uh, t different tape transfers from Al Schmidt at ABC Studios. Uh, but but these are a really a fine collection. I think you can find them somewhat reasonable in the stores. And uh, they have great liner notes, uh, in this case by David Wilde, who would write a lot of music stuff for Rolling Stone. So this also uh, was a great sort of more of an introduction to me on Coltrane Records. And of course, the other, other 
Village Vanguard tape. So they they would expand and do outtakes, alternative versions. And, and jazz is really one of the only labels doing this at the time in the 70s, more than rock and roll jazz. There were plentiful of these wonderful tapes. And of course, you know, the work of Coltrane was mined by ABC and Impulse, you know, after his death. And there's so many great recordings. This is part of that same series. This is an MCA, again, uh, originally an ABC, but stamped uh, by uh, MCA. And this is also a Kaskuna transfer. And then lastly, uh, I'm going to end with the gentle side of John Coltrane. And this again was an ABC record I had. Uh, this was a later branded copy by MCA. Again, these are great records. Uh, this is sort of a the moody side, uh, like almost like ballads. It has uh, early 1962, 63, and 64 recordings, like Nancy with the Laughing Face, Lush Life, Alabama, recorded in 63, After the Rain, In a Sentimental Mood, uh, The Spiritual, and produced by Bob Teal, except um, some stuff by Alice Coltrane. So it's got a little bit of the um, spiritual stuff mixed in with the moody stuff. But this is just a lovely, lovely uh, collection too. And this one was on ABC and Michael Cascuna wrote the liner notes to this. So uh, that's my uh, very short, you know, just a year long journey uh, at the close of ABC Records and then another year at MCA Records. And um, that's my label experience after retail record store experience. And again, this whole Steely Dan thing of these reissues brought back some of these memories. So thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Mazzy loves you.